Hello. My name is Lisa Rice, and I'm the president and CEO of the National Fair Housing Alliance. Welcome. And thank you for joining us for a very timely and critical discussion. The year 1968 may seem like far off history, a period quite unconnected to us today. It was a year of great turmoil. It was a year of unrest. It was a year of protest over racism and the Vietnam War. It was a year that Dr. King and Bobby Kennedy were assassinated. It was a year that, to quote Fannie Lou Hamer, people who were sick and tired of being sick and tired disrupted the Democratic National Convention. It was a year that not only rocked this nation, but the whole world. America was on full display. And in too many respects, the challenges we were facing 55 years ago still plague us today. When President Johnson convened the Kerner Commission, residential segregation, redlining, appraisal bias, and restrictive race-based zoning were the norm. These inventions were specifically designed to create racial inequality. And 55 years after the Kerner Commission released its report and recommendations for change in this nation, 55 years after passage of the Fair Housing Act, these challenges remain. We passed civil rights legislation that can often stop transactional bases of discrimination, but Congress never removed the structures of racism and apparatus of inequality. Those inequitable systems that were built using race conscious policies are still in place doing what they were designed to do. Today, our communities are more segregated than they were 100 years ago. The racial home ownership gaps are still as large as they were before the Kerner Commission released its report. COVID's impact fell harder on communities of color, not because Black, Latino, Asian, uh, Native, and Pacific Islanders were more susceptible to the virus, but because unjust systems amplify the disease's effect on these communities. Appraisal bias is draining homeowners in Black communities of $162 billion in wealth. The race-based zoning policies put in place decades ago to keep Black and Latino people out of certain communities are still in place. What's more, now we have technologies built with the tainted data emanating from our bias structures that generate discriminatory outcomes further perpetuating inequality. The Kerner Commission's work is yet unfinished. That is why LDF and NAFA teamed up to host today's event. Over the years, NAFA and LDF have partnered to tackle injustice. We have linked forces to save the disparate impact tool, a vital weapon in the fight against inequality when it has come under threat. We linked forces to stand up to the Trump administration's many attacks on fair housing and civil rights. And we're joining forces today to explore how we can collectively advance and build on the work of the Kerner Commission to eliminate racial inequality. Studies show that eliminating racial inequality against Black people alone would increase the U.S. GDP by $5 trillion over a five-year period grow our economy, and make our nation more productive and competitive. So addressing the issues identified in the Kerner Commission report aren't just important for improving the lives of individuals, it's important for improving our communities and our nation. I wanna thank this wonderful panel of esteemed experts that you'll hear from today for joining us. And I wanna particularly thank the phenomenal woman who is the next voice you will hear, Janae Nelson, President and General Counsel of the Legal Defense Fund, and the whole LDF family for their partnership through the years, and for also always joining forces with us at the National Fair Housing Alliance to dismantle racism. Thank you so much, Lisa, for that wonderful introduction and for setting the table for this important conversation. Many thanks to all of you for joining us. Uh, for this discussion on dismantling racism as we commemorate the 55th anniversary of the Kerner Commission report. That report was one of the most 
robust attempts in the history of the United States to date to force a reckoning with its ignominious origins of anti-Black racial subjugation and its ongoing effects. We are so pleased to host this event with the National Fair Housing Alliance, which as Lisa noted, has been a critical partner in our work to end housing discrimination, to further fair housing initiatives and to strengthen black communities. We are grateful to Lisa and the National Fair Housing Alliance staff. And of course, to the esteemed panelists that have gathered here for this discussion and all of you for your questions and your participation. When LDF was founded in 1940 by Thurgood Marshall, this country's aspirations for equality and due process of law were directly stifled by widespread state-sponsored racial inequality in every area of life. As the oldest civil rights law organization, LDF's mission has always been to transform that reality, to achieve racial justice, equality, in an inclusive society. And while state-sponsored segregation was ruled unlawful in 1954 in Brown versus Board of Education, racial discrimination perpetuated through government policy persists today. And in 1968, the Kerner Commission harnessed data to inform and ultimately shift the narrative concerning the root causes of the many uprisings that engulfed cities across the country in that year. And it revealed how systemic racism made and continues to make this country less prosperous, less just, and less safe. Since that time, LDF has continued to challenge public and private policies and practices that deny Black Americans equal employment, health care, and other opportunities to thrive. We fought to address unconstitutional and racially discriminatory law enforcement conduct and many of this work includes the partnership with NAFA. We have investigated uh, and challenged source of income discrimination and appraisal bias. We are working to re-envision public safety by creating data-informed frameworks that invest in Black communities and reduce violence. And we're pushing back against renewed attacks on Black political power from challenging redistricting in Alabama in a case before the Supreme Court to pushing back against efforts to strip power from largely black cities and black legislators in places like Mississippi and Tennessee and Washington DC. And I say all of this because these are many of the ills identified in the Kerner Commission report 55 years ago. And we have continued during that time to use litigation organizi organizing policy advocacy to challenge these laws and these tools of racism. Importantly, milestones like this allow us to critically examine our progress or lack thereof. And it, they force us to chart a more intentional and precise path forward. And the need for that critical examination cannot be more acute in this moment. Many of us are aware of the off-quoted text from the Kerner Commission report that is a searing indictment of our society, that our nation is moving toward two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. But I'm reminded of another passage of the report that encapsulates the depth of the threat we face if we continue to allow the warnings in the report to go unheeded. And equally important, it provides the inspiration needed to face it head on. That passage says, discrimination and segregation have long permeated much of American life they now threaten the future of every American. This deepening racial division is not inevitable. The movement apart can be reversed. Choice is still possible. Our principal task is to define that choice and to press for a national resolution to pursue our present course will involve continuing polarization of the American community and ultimately the, the destruction of basic democratic values. We are witnessing that destruction of democratic values today. And to lead us in a discussion of what a national resolution looks like, we have a distinguished group of panelists who will discuss the importance of the Kerner Commission report and the unfinished business to address systemic issues 
that it identified. Dr. Jelani Cobb is a professor and dean of the Columbia University Journalism School and has been a staff writer at The New Yorker since 2015. He received a Peabody Award for his 2020 PBS frontline film, Whose Vote Counts, and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in commentary in 2018. He is the author and editor of several books, including one that is at the center of this discussion, The Essential Kerner Commission Report. Derek Hamilton is the Henry Cohen Professor of Economics and Urban Policy and founding director of the Institute on Race, Power and Political Economy at the New School. He has been involved in crafting policy proposals that have inspired legislative proposals at the federal, state and local levels, including baby bonds, guaranteed income and federal job guarantees. Damon Hewitt is the president and executive director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law Prior to joining the Lawyers Committee, Damon served as the Executive Director of the Executives Alliance for Boys and Men of Color and a, and a Senior Advisor at the Open Society Foundations and was an attorney here at LDF for a decade. Elizabeth Hinton is an Associate Professor at the Department of History and the Department of African American Studies at Yale University and a Professor of Law at Yale Law School. She's written several books, including From the War and Poverty, to the War on Crime, The Making of Mass Incarceration in America, and America on Fire, The Untold History of Police Violence and Black Rebellion Since the 1960s. Finally, last but not least, Richard Rothstein is a distinguished fellow at the Economic Policy Institute, where he contributes to EPI's Working Economics blog and a senior fellow emeritus of LDF's Thurgood Marshall Institute. He is the author of Color of Law, a Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America, and his latest book with his daughter, Just Action, How to Challenge Segregation Enacted Under Color of Law. Let the conversation begin. Thank you, Janae. Uh, we're really excited to get into this conversation about this crucial and important subject matter, uh, recognizing the 55th anniversary of the Kerner Commission Report. In the summer of 1967, police officers in Newark pulled over a cab driver by the name of John Smith on July 12th. Their ensuing actions, which were involved pulling Mr. Smith from the vehicle, beating him in full view of the public, and then throwing him into a police vehicle and taking him to a precinct, set off like kindling tensions that had been growing in the city of Newark. What erupted in the aftermath of those actions were five days of revolt, uprising, violence, fire, and belated reckon reckoning. 10 days later, the city of Detroit ignited in a similar display for similar reasons. In the midst of this, a senator from Oklahoma by the name of Fred Harris had begun proposing a national commission to look at the origins of what they had conveniently bureaucratically referred, been referred to as civil disturbances. The Lyndon B. Johnson administration took Senator Harris up on his idea and President Lyndon Johnson created a commission which was chaired by then Illinois Governor Otto Kerner with the objective of examining the roots of the uprisings that were taking place across, American, across the United States. The commission, which consisted of 11 people, bipartisan, members of the Senate, of the House, also representative representation from labor and corporate uh, interests, uh, as well as uh, activists other, in other constituencies, it's overwhelmingly white. Nine white members, of nine of the 11 members were white, 10 
of the 11 members were male. None of the commission members were black and female. The work began amid some degree of skepticism. The idea is that uh, when you don't wanna solve a problem in Washington DC or when you want to kick the can down the road, you simply create a commission uh, which convenes and works uh, in uh, solitude until people forget about the problem. There's widespread skepticism about whether anything would come from this exercise. Kenneth Clark, the trailblazing psychologist who along with his wife, Mamie Clark, was responsible for the doll test. It was the centerpiece of the Brown versus Board of Education decision spoke outrightly, spoke clearly and said he didn't think that much would come of this exercise. Instead, these commission members, as unlikely as they were, embarked upon the creation of what is likely the most serious reckoning with the legacy and implications of racism in American life that we've seen in a government document before, or frankly, since. The commission's work, which began amidst the flames erupting in American cities, moved backward into history and laterally out into the connected, uh, interconnected ways in which these communities had been marginalized. Crucially, the commission began doing uh, examinations of the cities themselves, field trips in which the members would go to the communities that were affected. And, it, and soon came to understand that what had been categorized as a problem of policing was in fact a problem that affected every single institution that was involved in what they would have called uh, then the parlance of the, that time, the ghetto. The sweeping report and the sweeping recommendations of the Kerner Commission point us in a direction toward a more equitable, freer, and ultimately more democratic society. Issued in 1968, just weeks before the assassination of Martin Luther King and another wave a fiery reckoning in American cities and in American streets, the report exists as a kind of reference point for the roads not taken. In subsequent years, we have seen those kinds of reactions to the same sorts of institutional failures repeat like a Freudian nightmare which is to say something that happens again and again and again until the underlying conflict is resolved. We're fortunate to have with us a distinguished panel that will help us get some clarity around the significance of the Kerner Commission and the relevance of its insights in the contemporary landscape of race and inequality in American society. We can jump into this now we have, uh, you've already heard their introductions. We have with us Richard Rothstein, Elizabeth Hinton, Derek Hamilton, and Damon Hewitt. We're going to flip things just a little bit and we'll start with some questions that were submitted to us. And then in the second half of our conversation, we'll get into the specifics in each of their areas of interest. So first, welcome, thank you for being with us today. And the first question, 55 years after the Kerner Report, what is your feeling about how it helped or did not help in the fight for justice? And what are your thoughts on the usefulness of similar reports today? And I will start <laughs> on my screen with Elizabeth and then Derek and then Damon and then Richard. We can't hear you. I don't think we can hear you. The 
we don't have audio. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I was muted. Um, sorry about that. First, I just want to thank the National Fair Housing Alliance and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund for having uh, this really, really critical conversation as we approach this pivotal moment in our history. And, you know, I, I think after the racial reckoning, as it's been called, of 2020, the Kerner Commission kind of took on a new significance um, in the sense that the, the Kerner Commission, in many ways, outlined exactly the kinds of massive policy changes and restructuring that is necessary in order to address the deep, deep problems of racial, class, gender, and economic inequality in the U.S. And so, you know, the, la I, the last thing we need is really another commission uh, to study these problems, as um, I think Jelani mentioned, you know, like kicking the can down the road to continue to avoid um, major ma the major structural interventions that are required. The Kerner Commission laid it all out. We need investments in jobs, perhaps first and foremost. We need investments in housing. We need to ensure that everybody has access to decent, livable housing that isn't um, reliant on exploitative exploitative. Uh, relations between landlords or pu public housing officials and tenants. Uh, we need a massive overhaul of our public school systems. These are the kinds of bold investments and bold visions for the country that the Kerner Commission laid out. And we don't need another commission to tell us that because in the absence of these major necessary and required structural changes, we're still very much living um, with the same socioeconomic inequalities that led to the urban unrest or the urban rebellions of the 60s and 70s um, and continued racial injustice in our own time. So I think, um, as you said, Jelani, that the, the commission report is, um, is a roadmap for us. Derek, you're muted too. Am I, can you hear me you now? Hear you now. Right. I hear you now. So I think um, I agree with Elizabeth and also want to offer my thanks, but I won't go in detail because I know we have a lot to say, but um, it provided some truth and reconciliation, which is important. I mean, the fact that we're still talking about it today um, is both problematic and useful. So it, it helps us understand inequality. It helps us understand power. And it, it uh, situates inequality and poverty at its root, which is resource deprivation, which is uh, an intentional uh, state actions that create structures that inhibit uh, the dignity, the productivity, and the inclusion of various populations. But it's not enough. What is missing is redress. I mean, there are parallels as, as we think today about the movement towards reparations, which is gaining more saliency, where truth and reconciliation and redress are complementary and both necessary. If we have the re redress without uh, the understanding of how we got there, we're bound to repeat it again. And if we just do the truth and reconciliation without the redress, the economic conditions that predicated the 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 exploitation and extrapolation still remain. Um, indeed, the backlash to the Kerner Commission that came about from people like Ronald Reagan, Nixon, two presidents that, that uh, critiqued the, the report even when it was issued. Well, they have created this genre of a, of a neoliberal political mo movement that has come to naturalize poverty and inequality by castigating it as the result of some deficient behavior and that when government does intervene, they intervene in a way that not only uh, offers these undeserving super predators, welfare queens and deadbeat dads an unfair advantage, but in a way that becomes counterproductive for them themselves by arguing that it creates further structures of dependencies, uh, further incentives not to invest in oneself. So there's a certain amount of irony. The irony is that without the redress, it, it, it enabled a backlash, a right-wing backlash that used a new 
that used the document and the movement itself to create a new genre that almost that has become to naturalize poverty. Um, and I'll be real quick and just say this, and I know we're going to get into solutions. In my in in my estimation, the solution ro- resides with a more complete notion of human rights. Human rights not limited to political, civil, and cultural rights, which are important, um, but are inadequate, incomplete, and co-opting without economic rights, without some baseline level of resource by which people can actually engage in transaction without being exploited or at the whim of somebody's charitable inkling. And then the other thing that we have to keep in mind is these economic rights have to be intentionally inclusive. They have to be designed, implemented, and managed in such a way that the most marginalized are intentionally included, or the de facto is a system, a structure of racism by which the country has been built, and the stimulus and whatever comes about from any type of intervention has the potential to further exacerbate inequality without that intentionality. Damon. Uh, thank you, Jelani, and thanks so much again to Nafa and Lisa Rice and, and LDF and Janae and colleagues and all, all of those who are assembled today in the audience. So, you know, I, I have mixed feelings about the Kerner Commission report uh, from everything you laid out, Jelani, uh, to from the composition of the commission itself to perhaps most substantively, the notion that at its core, the genesis of the report was really about a problem statement, a problem to be solved. And I won't say there's nothing useful, there's certainly many useful pieces, and I'll talk about a couple of those, at least at a high level in in a minute, but this notion that the Negro, the Black person, or the Black person's behavior is the reason for the report, the problem to be solved. The uh, Black people as a problem statement gives me significant pause. And that type of entry point certainly uh, colors and skews what the substance could be and, and was and certainly what the recommendations were and of course the uptake. So we're in this ironic position of defending what's good about the report because there was a, a lot of good there but also critiquing it as well and I guess that is our mission as uh, as cause lawyers as racial justice advocates uh, to do just that. So th- that is an issue. So I also think I'm struck by what Derek said about truth and reconciliation, there certainly was, I think, an obsession with the reconciliation. I think the good part of the truth was some grounding in historical context, which is really helpful. Uh, So many times in the country, we uh, look at history backwards from what happened uh, just now and work our way backwards instead of understanding what got us uh, to this point in a fair, accurate, and truthful way. That's the very battle we're facing, frankly, with K-12 curriculum right now uh, under the guise of attacks on critical race theory, which most K-12 curriculum is not. It's a far cry, as we know, from critical race theory. So the grounding of historical context is important, but there's such an obsession with the reconciliation part. You know, Brian Stevenson from Equal Justice Initiative, a great writer, scholar, and advocate, uh, talks about how truth and reconciliation must be sequential. And I do believe that the Kerner Commission tells a good chunk of truth that had never been memorialized, certainly by uh, a body composed as it was, by primarily white men. So there's a usefulness, utility, certainly, uh, functionally and symbolically there. But the truth is, we've been waiting on America to tell the whole truth for a long time. And so the obsession uh, with reconciliation that we saw then in 1968 is echoed and reflected today. Uh, what can we do to build police community trust and relations? And by that, many people often mean, how do we get community to trust the police? In fact, what we need to focus on is how do we get police to trust the community and not you know, unnecessarily harm, injure, or kill and target, target us. So the, the obsession with the, the reconciliation, I get it. Uh, we want solutions in this country, not just to admire the problem, but we've got to start really making sure we tell the, the whole truth, the entire truth, uh, and nothing but that truth. And in today's environment where we are rife with uh, mis and intentional disinformation, where we see narratives twisted, as, as Derek and others have mentioned, it's very difficult 
uh, what we need is a return to what I believe was at the heart of the credit commission effort to introduce the thing that actually got us some of the civil rights legislation that we had even before uh, the uh, the uprisings, before the riots, before the report itself, uh, which is a renewed sense of moral clarity, a bright line about what is right and what is wrong, uh, a bright line uh, that tells us that exclusion should not be an option from society, uh, from the opportunity to 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 profit, to develop and gain wealth, to prosper, uh, to have a voice, to have power. Uh, that's the bright line that uh, we need. And finally, I would say that uh, I agree with Elizabeth uh, Hinton that we don't need another report to tell us these things. I do think when properly leveraged, the reports are reminders. Uh, I would love that uh, just the way you have, in, whether it be a law review article or a, an, an academic piece or a piece for public consumption, uh, a lot of it is the research. In law review articles, a lot of it is the footnotes. It is understanding the thinking that came before, the past that came before, not pretending that we're Christopher Columbus and we Eureka just discovered uh, a, a new issue, a new problem or a new solution. There's not a whole lot new under the sun. It's how we process, analyze and leverage it. So if there is a future such report, I will hope that it doesn't just simply cite the Kerner Commission, but that it learns the lessons and failures uh, of thought and implementation all along the way. Richard. Well, thank you, Jelani, and it's terrific being here with all of you distinguished people. Um, I agree. We have enough reports. We know what to do. Uh, there's no absence of ideas about how to fix segregation and its ongoing effects. What's missing is not more ideas, not more reports. What's missing is a new activist grassroots civil rights movement that's going to create the political pressure and will to implement some of the ideas that we already have. We have a very polarized country today, but there's an enormous potential for such a new grassroots movement. 20 million Americans participated in Black Lives Matter demonstrations in 2020. They were suburban and urban. They were black and white, Hispanic and others. They were men and women, young and old. It was the largest outpouring for racial justice in this country's history and the most diverse. And yet at the end of those demonstrations, too many of those demonstrators in both suburban and urban communities went home. They put Black Lives Matter signs on their lawns and did nothing further to make Black Lives Matter. What we need now is not more reports that those people can read. What we need now is a national core of organizers who can knock on the doors of those people and get them mobilized to take action, to press for the implementation of the ideas that we already have. Let me uh, make one other point. Uh, there was a reference before to systemic racism. It's a term that very few people outside of an in-group understand. What they can understand is once you've created enormous inequality in this country, race neutral policies can have a different impact on the disadvantaged, on blacks and on whites. And most of those policies are local. They can be addressed locally by the kinds of grassroots movements I talked about. The um, segregation that we have, and I documented this in, in my previous book, The Color of Law, was created by government, by the federal, state, and local governments that imposed segregation and required uh, private discrimination as well. It may be that many private people wanted to discriminate, but had the federal government not required them to do so, it wouldn't happen. But there's an enormous implication to that. If it was created by government, that makes it an unconstitutional system of inequality that we have. It was a violation of the 14th, 13th Amendments in particular. And if we have an unconstitutional system of racial inequality, that puts an obligation on all of us, all of us as Americans, if we take our responsibilities of citizenship seriously, to do something to redress it. So that's an obligation that needs to be aroused, uh, inspired. And as I said, uh, there are so many policies at a local level now that sustain it, uh, segregation to sustain inequality. They don't have to any longer be racially specific. 
they don't have to be discriminatory on their face because we have an unequal society. Race neutral policies perpetuate that segregation. Many of them are at the local level. Many of them can be addressed by activists. And it, what we need is more activists and perhaps even fewer reports. Um, I think we have another question um, that was submitted before, which is how do federal investments or the lack thereof or tax policies impact our progress to dismantle racism? And we'll, so let's go in the opposite order this time. So we'll start with Richard. Well, I'm gonna build a little bit more on what I said. Um, <clears throat> there is no political appetite for federal policies today that are going to significantly redress segregation. So of course, tax policies reinforce it, federal tax policies reinforce it, but there are many local policies that reinforce it as well that are actionable and that we could develop movements to redress. So for example, uh, you're probably aware of the reports that document in almost every metropolitan area in this country. African-Americans pay more property taxes relative to the value of their homes than whites do. It's a systemic problem, but it's not a race specific problem. It's because the way in which we assess properties inevitably is going to create assessments that are higher in neighborhoods, for example, that appreciate in value more slowly than it will um, in neighborhoods that appreciate in value more rapidly. That's a purely local issue. Property assessment, assessments are done by counties and by cities and a local movement of activists could create the mobilization of a movement that could demand refunds to African-American homeowners who paid excessive taxes. That's something that's not federal, but it's actionable and it's conceivable that it could happen. We have policies uh, that actually stem from the Kerner Commission report. Uh, the low income housing tax credit was a recommendation of the Kerner Commission report, a federal subsidy for the, for the housing of low income families. That program, necessary program, reinforces segregation, not because it's a race specific program, but because developers would rather place low-income housing in low-income neighborhoods. There, uh, when those uh, systems of placing low-income housing tax credit projects are developed at the state and local level, racial justice act activists could have a voice in the placement of those projects to ensure that they don't reinforce segregation. The same thing is true of another program that was uh, recommended by the Kerner Commission and it was then implemented, the Section 8 voucher program, with which we're all familiar. The Section 8 voucher program reinforces segregation, not because it's, there's something in the purposes of the program that say they should reinforce segregation, but the vouchers are structured in such a way that they're more usable in low-income neighborhoods, in already segregated neighborhoods. That's something that can be addressed at the local level. These vouchers are, are administered by local public housing authorities we're not going to get a federal mandate that uh, requires a different way of assigning these voucher opportunities, but it can be done locally. There are many communities now, well, not many, there are some communities now that provide higher vouchers, higher voucher amounts if people use them in higher opportunity communities, but public housing authorities don't want to uh, implement that opportunity and they won't do it without public pressure, without a movement a grassroots movement that's going to demand that it happen. So those are the kinds of things that we can do at a local level in the absence of a political will at the federal level to do something about it. Um, and anyone else who wants to weigh in? Like uh, Derek, I assume you want to jump in on this. Yeah, because I, I disagree with Richard uh, uh, on a few things. One is uh, the notion of race neutrality. There's no such thing in America. Uh, from our origins, we've been grounded in um, race stratification. So uh, also the issue of segregation, I think it's more an issue of resource deprivation as opposed to segregation. It happens that the predominantly white neighborhoods tend to have greater resources than predominantly black neighborhoods. But there's nothing uh, economic about putting a black person next to a white person that's going to lead to their development. In fact, it could create some hostility. 
Um, we may as we as a society may like the aesthetic of integration, and that's fine, and we should invest in it. Um, but we should be clear in understanding why there is inequality and poverty. And again, there's nothing magical about a black person being next to a white person. And then the issue with uh, race in general, um, not only well, Derek, are- Derek, let me let me ask a quick follow up question to that. Sure. Yeah, isn't the logic of integration um, simply, uh, you know, maybe not the kind of universal humanistic idea of human of brotherhood and sisterhood and you know one big human family, but a more cynical kind of idea that by simply putting black people and white people in closer proximity, it becomes harder to institutionally discriminate against black people. That those problems uh, that you would direct at one population are much harder to implement when that population is in fact heterogeneous. Yeah, I mean, actually, I don't think that's practically true. I mean, Mm -hmm. we see it in our school systems where we get apartheid-like structures in integrated schools. The black, the black kids get assigned to the remedial classes and the white kids get assigned to the advanced placement classes. Um, again, I'm supportive of the aesthetic of an integrated society. Um, and we may try to promote it in various ways, but as it relates to um, notions of why racism exists, it is more weaponized as opposed to ignorance. It, there's nothing magical about putting two groups together that will lead to enlightenment. Um, I think there is public policy that we can do that can uh, lead to greater enlightenment, basically uh, diminish the value associated with white white supremacy, diminish the value associated with the property rights and whiteness, lead to less despair overall in society. Fascism becomes more popular the greater the despair and inequality that exists in society. So an economic rights framework provide some of the tools to dis- defame some of the venom associated with white supremacy in, in my estimation. Um, but you know, a couple of other points to make about what Richard said. Um, we know that at every level of income, black people are more likely to be audited than white people. It's not just simply an issue of concentration of class. It has to do with black people have less, not only economic power, but political power. Black people also are just marginalized because of their identity. It is naive if we don't recognize that every single structure and policy in America includes both economic, political, and identity group stratification aspects. The the ability to pass certain policies is result from how we define people as deserved or undeserved, and that's grounded in racism. So um, to answer the question about the tax code, that is our most potent physical tool we have. So I love the question. I think that on the progressive side, um, we pay a lot of attention to agencies like HUD, like Health and Human Services, like the Department of Labor, which are all valuable. But the real action in terms of economic inclusion is at Treasury. That the tax code is well beyond revenue collection. It is the tool by which we decide who the winners and losers are in society. A tax cut is the same thing as a tax subsidy on a federal ledger. We we get to choose how resources are distributed. And we've seen precedents um, as a result of this pandemic, a silver lining. The IRS was capable of sending money directly to the American people in a very expedient, efficient way uh, that saved us from a Great Depression. So I think the lesson here is when we look at the tax code, we should have a bullseye on Treasury, and we should think about that as the mechanism by which we can have the type of policies that um, Elizabeth, uh, Damon, and and Richard have been advocating for, a a more inclusive society. Liz, did you want to... Yeah, just a couple of things. So um, on the tax issue, this is something that I actually um, argued in my conclusion to America on Fire. If we think about the the unfair tax system in the U.S. in the context of defund, uh, we don't have to defund anything. We can just tax the rich and tax corporations their fair share and redistribute the wealth that they have been um, appropriating and extracting from everyone else from themselves to begin to imagine some of the very policies that the Kerner Commission laid out and to begin um, the necessary redistribution. 
I think with that and who would kind of oversee that distribution, of course, is the federal government. And, and I want to address that part of the question, too, because I agree with Richard that, you know, local struggles are really, really key. But historically, you know, we've seen the the kind of precarious role that the federal government has played in terms of issues for racial justice. So every kind of like major advancement um, in racial for racial justice in this country has been the result of federal intervention with the abolition of slavery, the reconstruction amendments, um, a century later, the enactment of the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, and of course, going back to the 1950s with, uh, with Brown v. Board, which the LDF was so instrumental in. Mm -hmm. That has all been the result of federal um, leadership and federal action. Part of the problem is, as W.E.B. Du Bois brilliantly pointed out in Black Reconstruction, is that those federal interventions always stop short of economic enfranchisement. And mm -hmm. that economic enfranchisement was part of what uh, the Kerner Commission was advocating for. It was, you know, it basically said to the Johnson administration, look, you know, the civil rights legislation, the war on poverty is great, but it's got to go further, which also mirrored what mainstream uh, civil rights activists from King on down were advocating by that point in the 1960s. So I do think we have our work um, cut out for us. And Richard, I, I really loved what you said about the, you know, how it's 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 uh, the necessary next step is to begin to build a robust um, social movement to build that uh, political will. But I think that, you know, we, we, we are going to need um, federal leadership and major federal intervention um, to realize some of the very, very ambitious policies that we've been talking about. And part of that, you know, could, could just be, it's not that complicated, just tax rich people what they owe, um, stop giving corporate welfare in the way that you do, and let's start spreading out uh, the resources in this country. Jelani, the cake is baked. I'll put some icing on it, um, which I think, I won't say it sums it all up, but on the tax policy, we tax income by and large, and to some extent assets, but not really wealth. And that is the fundamental problem. That's why we can have a higher tax rate. Where I'm from, New Orleans, the effective tax rate, well, that's not the right term, but the, the total combined tax burden for local and state is not, about nine and a half percent on everything you buy wow. in Orleans Parish in New Orleans, Louisiana, which is a majority black you know, city, uh, which is not overall a poor city, but there's a lot of poor uh, impoverished folks. We don't have a lot of money. And so we're taxing the wrong thing. We're also investing in the wrong thing. Uh, after Hurricane Katrina, one of the cases I had the privilege to litigate when I was still at LDF was a case about housing recovery. Most of the community development block grant money to Louisiana went not to people who were renters, who are the majority of residents in the city, not to the one third of black people who had no access to a vehicle and couldn't get out before the storm, but to homeowners. Now there are a lot of black homeowners, but even that provision had a discriminatory formula because your grant to recover was based either on the cost to repair the damage or the pre-storm market value of your house. So the investment was made, most of the money, a, a majority of money went to those who had higher market values. You can have an identical house in a white neighborhood and a black neighborhood that has very different market values because guess what? The market discriminates. Same type of house, same damage, same cost to repair, but the market says the house in the white neighborhood is worth more. So that's that's the way I try to connect what I'm hearing from, uh, in particular, Derek and Richard, uh, and, and also Elizabeth, because it's about how we are taxing where the money is coming from, but also what investments are we actually making? And there's ways in which it's all bound up with race in place, although there is no no single bullet, a silver bullet uh, single solution. You know, I want to get into some specific um, questions around your um, your particular areas of expertise, uh, but I have to ask. I know we're being mindful of our time here. You know, you all have brilliance and you know vast amounts of knowledge on this, but I have to ask you to be you know fairly succinct, you know, despite you know these big questions. But um, Liz, I wonder if you could talk a little bit um, about the the role of militarization of the police. Um, in the timeline that we've seen, obviously, uh, you know, Kerner marked a, a compar wildly candid assessment of policing uh, when you consider where we have gone from there. You know, the language and conversation around policing um, was much more uh, open and critical in 1968 than I think in subsequent years. 
uh, especially in the form of kind of government dialogue about it. And so I wonder if you could talk particularly about the role of mil militarization uh, of the police and the way it is implicated in the issues that uh, we see lingering from Kerner to now. So here we get into some of the more uh, problematic aspects of the Kerner Commission report that I really appreciate um, Damon, you know, just calling out and bringing our attention to. I'm going to try to be brief on this. Um, but, you know, one of the things that's true about the Kerner Commission and many other what they were called during the 60s and 70s, like state and local human relations commissions that would that would. Um, identify the causes and offer solutions after there was a rebellion, um, an incident of uh, community violence in response to police violence during this period. And they'd always, just like the Kerner Commission, point out all of the socioeconomic underlying root causes and then make some suggestions to improve police community relations. And the only thing that gets implemented, and this is true of, of part of the Kerner Commission report, um, are the policing initiatives, you know, not the socioeconomic. It's always continuing to manage these larger problems with policing and with surveillance and with incarceration. Um, the Kerner Commission, as Damon mentioned, was operating under a set of assumptions about Black Americans and poverty and crime and looked at um, violence and crime in many urban communities through a kind of pathological uh, lens. That is, that it was a, a tied to poverty and a behavioral issue among Black Americans. And so um, that really ends up steering the kind of realm of possibility that they um, recommended for reforming police in America. I think some of their more progressive recommendations that, again, we hear very, you know, that still come up today, civilian review boards, um, more training for police, uh, greater investments in, um, in programs that bring police and residents into dialogue together, resident tenant patrols, all these things that we know actually do um, improve public safety in communities the Kerner Commission advocated for. But unfortunately, um, those recommendations weren't um, taken into account or weren't implemented. It was the more hard-lined recommendations, increasing police officers in certain areas, um, developing tactical patrols, the kind of seeds of the, of, of, of the units that we saw um, unleashing deadly horrific violence on Tyree Nichols in Memphis, that is the Scorpion unit. These kind of tactical, tactical units the Kerner Commission recommended. And I think one of the really, really good examples of the way that the Kerner Commission advocated um, for a military, militarized or increasingly militarizing local law enforcement through a kind of progressive lens is through its advocacy for tear gas. Um, the Kerner Commission looked at what happened in Newark and Detroit and saw that uh, basically, you know, the police and National Guard were shooting indiscriminately. Um, at black residents. The implication, you know, in these cities with high death tolls, I think some 43 people d died in Detroit was that, you know, uh, the residents themselves, black residents were um, acting in an aggressive way towards the police and the police were defending themselves. Again, you know, the way that police continue to have a, a monopoly on violence today and often these, in these incidents are discussed um, uh, in, our, in our current climate. But in fact, you know, these officers were scared and we're just shooting off their guns and people died because of it. So the Kerner Commission said we need, um, you know, a non-lethal weapon for police to be able to use during these moments of um, unrest and suggested tear gas, which, of course, had been used um, in Selma and other places earlier in the 1960s. But as a result of the Kerner Commission's recommendations, tear gas has really become the go to for crowd control, not just in the U.S., but uh, uh, um, around the world in the decades since. And we saw how tear gas and other, you know, non-lethal weapons, um, rubber bullets, bean bags, pepper spray, were just horrifically deployed against completely non-violent protesters in 2020. So, you know, that's an example of how something that is seen as a progressive or liberal reform um, actually can exacerbate the problem and take on really, really um, uh, insidious, uh, uh, practices as it's implemented. And, you know, that is another legacy um, of, the, of the Kerner Commission. So, Derek, um, I wonder if you could talk uh, a little bit about um, how this wealth, wealth inequality factors into this and also about your ideas around uh, baby bonds and federal job guarantees. Yeah, I mean, wealth is a critical ingredient for people's 
productive capacities, we think about wealth as an outcome, but its essence is functional, what it can do for you, the input that it, that it provides people. Um, I think in general, one thing that we're missing is a North Star conception of freedom and justice. I think that there is a, a built up conservative view of what freedom and justice is, uh, and what's absent from it is the conceptions of economic rights. Again, at, to be somewhat redundant, thinking about, politi poli think about political, civil, and cultural rights in the absence of economic rights leaves people vulnerable. And you know that ties into wealth because wealth is a paramount indicator of economic well-being. So uh, we may ask, if, if, if that seems so obvious that people need some resources, that people need health care, that people need schooling, that people need housing, that people need food, that people need free mobility throughout society without the threat of harm or detention at the hands of a state-sanctioned terror. If these are all rights that we all think are reasonable and people should have in a well-functioning society, we should ask the second question, well, what is inhibiting that? And there lies race. Why, why is it that we can have a structure over the last 55 years since the release of the Kerner Commission that America has grown increasingly concentrated in both political and economic power at the top. How has that been able to take place in a democracy? Well, there's race is the answer. Race is the answer. The ability to offer a dominant political group some relative status. In other words, racism isn't just some irrational bigotry but rather it is a weapon. It is a strategic tool that can be used to offer some individuals, some groups of individuals relative status. And we need, as it was pointed out by our colleagues, a new definition of how we define value. And in so doing, we need to look beyond the self-interested accumulation that leads to this tribalism and promote other humanistic attributes of our economy like shared prosperity, like investing in humans for their productive capacity rather than uh, some charitable consuming agents. Uh, all this stuff is necessary. And um, I think the human rights frame where we include policies like baby bonds that ensure birthright to capital, uh, policies like a federal job guarantee that ensure that we can fulfill one of the essence of being a human being which is contribute productively to society without uh, the limited power that comes to play when you try to enter an employment agreement and you have no resources. So the federal government essentially would set a floor. It doesn't get rid of the private sector. It says at a minimum, if you want to engage in labor markets, housing markets, schooling markets, capital markets, you have to offer at least this in order to engage in those markets because we will provide a base level of resources so that people can actually engage in that. Thank you. Um, Damon, I wonder if you could talk about the landscape of voting rights, um, you know, from 1968. If you look at uh, the time frame that the Kerner Commission report was issued, this is in the immediate aftermath of the not very long uh, aftermath of uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. I wonder if you could talk about where we are in that landscape now. Well, it's, it's a complicated picture. We need an hour just for that, uh, Jelani. But, you know, to sum it up, you know, the late John Lewis uh, rightfully said that the right to vote or our vote rather uh, is precious, almost sacred. It's the most powerful nonviolent tool, he said, that we have to create a more perfect union. The fact is, and this will blow people's minds, under the U.S. Constitution, there isn't a right to vote in the Constitution. We have federal laws that uh, prevent the curtailment, designed to prevent the curtailment of uh, voting rights that exist under state law and access to the ballot. But overall, we know that it's not just about the vote, it's about voice, it's about vitality, it's about power and frankly, self-determination, the same uh, battle for black folks since the days of chattel slavery. Uh, could we get to a say in how we are governed, a say in the conditions in which we live, to say in the opportunities uh, that we have. And so we know that the Voting Rights Act of 1965, uh, predating the Kerner Commission by three years, was transformative. 
if you look at the period just before the commission report and the period just after that maybe five year span, we saw a significant uptick in black voter registration that led to by the late 60s, early 70s and into the 80s, uh, tremendous progress in terms of black elected officials uh, being elected. Now, that's not the success. The success is the black community being able to elect our candidates of choice, not just that as a black elected official um, uh, at any rate, but you saw the progress primarily in states like Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, my home state, Louisiana, North Carolina, South Carolina. Uh, now, what we've seen though is a political project designed to gut the Voting Rights Act, call it into question. It's been reauthorized uh, certainly, uh, uh, you know, uh, multiple times, uh, including during Republican-led administrations in the White House uh, and many Republicans in Congress. But that all changed after the Shelby County case in 2013. All of a sudden, you can't even barely get a floor vote on reauthorizing the Voting Rights Act because everything the Supreme Court has done to gut the act in terms of the very strong pre-clearance provision that required all those states, those jurisdictions, to have a documented history of racial discrimination in voting, to get all of their voting changes pre-approved, meaning changing polling hours, polling places, uh, drop boxes, uh, you know, er early voting, by mail voting. All of those changes no longer have to go through a pre-clearance by the Department of Justice or federal court. So it leaves us playing whack-a-mole trying to challenge these. So uh, our organization, the Lawyers Committee, many others uh, do our best to challenge it, but it is an uphill battle. The irony is the same mechanisms that were banned before Shelby County all of a sudden become legal, uh, potentially, at least uh, presumptively under the eyes of the law, right? That's not how we see it, but that's how many jurisdictions are moving. And so it doesn't change the political reality for Black people and political power on the ground. So the battle we're facing is uh, a fast avalanche of backsliding based upon decades long of chipping away at the foundation trying to create, frankly, that avalanche of backslide. We're seeing, uh, of course, as many of us know, in 2020 and 2021, many state legislatures adopt new restrictions on voting that make it harder for everyone to vote, but specifically targeting the newer means that Black voters have been using. Uh, before the pandemic, Black folks in the South especially didn't typically vote by mail. We went to the polls. That's how you get souls to the polls on Sundays and what have you. Uh, or, or, or on the, the last Sunday before an election is the, the, the typical thing, time when the uh, politicians come to your church. But folks started voting the way they felt safe. Absentee voting, drop boxes, mail voting, no excuse, what have you. Those means are now being targeted. So there is, I look at this as a kind of a continuum. As long as there have been elections in this country, there's been racial discrimination in voting, and for a long time, gender discrimination as well. So the battle is never won with as a natural resting or landing place. Uh, the political project of anti-Black racism requires constant vigilance. And so the, the battlefront of voting rights and exercising and garnering political power will certainly continue uh, to be salient. Uh, the Supreme Court is poised to do even more damage this term. I know we don't have time to, to go into detail, but suffice it to say that everything that people knew and took for granted, even just a few years ago, is at risk in terms of how well we can protect the right to vote, which again is not even in the Constitution uh, as an absolute affirmative right. Richard, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about <clears throat> your most recent book, Just, Act, Just Action, and the ways in which people can address uh, and remedy uh, housing discrimination and segregation. Sure, I've, I've referred to some of it already. Um, let me just say, uh, you know, I agree, of course, that no, nobody can disagree that uh, a federal progressive tax system would have transformative effects that the, there are many things that can be done at the federal level, but we're so deeply polarized and it's, the polarization is exaggerated by gerrymandering that um, holding hope out for federal policy uh, is um, a way to ensure that nothing will happen positively in the short run and certainly within my lifetime and maybe even in some of yours. Um, but there's so much that can be done locally and that's what the new book uh, that you refer to, Just Action, describes. For example, uh, if we succeed 
in policies that improve the resources in existing African-American neighborhoods, right, the kinds of things that some of you have referred to. It is inevitable that as the neighborhoods become better resourced, they will cease to be exclusively African-American. More middle-class people of all races will want to move in and they can't be stopped. And you get a process that we talk, talk about is called gentrification. You can't have it both ways. The only way to keep a neighborhood all black is to keep it segregated and um, low, poorly resourced. So if you improve those conditions, they will become more diverse. So what do you do to prevent displacement from gentrification? These are all local actions and they'll only happen if there's a locally mobilized movement to demand that they happen. To prevent massive displacement from gentrification, you can adopt a local inclusionary zoning law that requires new development to preserve a share of its new units for low and moderate income families for the existing residents. You can have a program to finance land trusts that hold own nonprofit groups that hold ownership to the land, but that build affordable, maybe single family homes even on the land so that they're affordable to existing residents, to African-Americans uh, who live there already, uh, affordable because the price of the land is no longer incorporated into the price of the house. You can have, um, as I described before, uh, policies that uh, prevent the reinforcement of segregation by the placement of all low-income units in those neighborhoods. So there are many, many things that can be done to um, prevent massive dislocation from gentrification, but they won't happen without a local movement. What the new book does, Just Action does, is it describes policy after policy, program after program, that each one of which would have a small impact on the inequality that results from uh, segregation, but in combination would have a big impact. The advantage of them over focusing on federal policy is that they're achievable in the short run. If there's a mobilized uh, constituency to do it, and as I, I said before, Jelani, um, the, the massive turnout for the Black Lives Matter demonstrations indicates to me that there's an untapped uh, potential for participation in a racial justice movement that goes beyond the, the think tanks that we at the turning out reports that to which we devote so much attention. And that potential can be mobilized and in, in favor of so many of these policies that uh, can redress segregation and its effects. We are right about at our time. Um, so I wondered if we could do something really quick. It's just a kind of um, speed round, um, you know, for one minute each about you know, the most single most significant thing you think of the legacy of the Kerner report is. Um, and Liz, we can start with you and go to Derek, Damon, and Richard. Richard. I, I mean, okay, so so I I will say, and this might kind of repeat some of the things that um, that I said earlier, but. Um, again, I really do think that even for the kind of changes and policies that Richard's advocating, we need to have some kind of a national guidepost or national roadmap. And so I think that, you know, the Credit Commission began um, a new level of recognition on the part of officials at all levels of government. <laughs> um, but of course, this was a presidential task force um, for the first time in U.S. history of the way that racism um, shaped social relations and the development of American institutions. And it was, um, I think that's one of the legacies when we talk about um, racism today, institutional racism, racism, systemic racism, which became a buzzword um, during the reckoning of 2020. Um, you know, a, the, the root of that or what kind of laid that out in its best selling. Uh, paperback form was the Kerner Commission report. So the attention to racism, um, and again, that quote that uh, Janae said at, at, the, at the top, which is that the nation is two societies, one black, one white, separate un and unequal. Um, that's, the, you know, that recognition and the solution to that is what we're still very much dealing with today. Yeah. Derek. Yeah, however, Inadequate it may have been, and uh, Damon pointed out some a lot of the inadequate uh, aspects of it. It was go government taking public responsibility. It was government 
uh, taking some onus for the conditions that existed in society. That's a great legacy. I'd say that um, it, it bridges to things like Joe Biden's executive, executive order that uh, requires federal agencies to take account of the conditions of Black people in their plans, missions, and also recording data, and also to take some actions to redress it. Th those are all good legacies. Um, really quick, I'll just say federal policy, local policy, and state policy certainly are not mutually exclusive. We can do uh, all of them, and we should be doing all of them. And then I also think one, one way to redress some of the harms that might be associated with gentrification might be direct guarantees to people. So making sure the resources and the investments are tied to people directly. The, thank you, John. The Kerner Commission report is in some ways the logical extension of the Supreme Court's decision in, in Brown v. Board of Education, uh, where the court spoke about how segregation of the races has a negative impact on, in the language of the time, colored children talked about inferiority complex that sets in. The idea is right. The problem statement is a bit off. If the problem statement is focused on uh, people as the problem, black people especially, uh, or the harms only uh, accruing uh, to one, one group of people. Um, if this is to be a multiracial democracy, which I think we sh should be fighting for, and I say that as leader of a black centered organization, um, we, we need all parts of society to be strong, to be clear, and to have access to fairness uh, and justice. So to go back to what I said earlier, you know, I think that I talked about truth and, and reconciliation to take up Derek's theme, as, uh, as Brian Stevenson says, being sequential. The truth is distorted today. We have to keep telling these truths and understanding new angles and new truths and be willing and open to whether it be private sector or, as, as Derek said, government uh, action, intervention, and political will being willing to evolve as an understanding of what's true and what's real evolves as well. And Richard, we have the last word to you. Well, the advance, the biggest advance of the Kerner Commission report, I think, was saying that uh, the problems of this society in terms of racial inequality were created by white institutions. That was an advance because too many people in the society then, including uh, many African-Americans, believed that the problems of African-Americans in this country were their own fault, not working hard enough, not going to school long enough. Uh, taking the, that, which now seems to be obvious, taking the focus off of that and saying it was white institutions that created it was a big advance in terms of public understanding. It was a challenge, it seems obvious now, but it was a challenging concept to most people who read that report in 1968. But it didn't go far enough because it wasn't white institutions amorphously. It was government action that created the segregation that we know today. And by not calling that out explicitly, the Kerner Commission gave people no route forward to uh, redress it. Uh, let me, uh, if we understand that, that we have an unconstitutional apartheid system in this country, as I said earlier, that places an obligation upon all of us, not just policy writers, not just people like the panelists on, in this group, including me, but on ordinary people to do something about it. It is certainly true, as was just said, that state, local, and federal policy all have to work together to do something about it. But you and your neighbors have much more influence on local policy, and that's the place where we have to start. And if we begin to win small victories there that redress small aspects of segregation and its inequality, we can create a movement that can build and eventually lead to a federal movement, a national movement that can influence national policy. But the place to start is with you and your neighbors, and uh, I'm hopeful that we can see a resurgence of that kind of activity in this country uh, that mobilizes those 20 million people into a real coalition of local movements that will grow to a federal level. So I wanna thank you, uh, Richard, and also you, Damon and Derek and Elizabeth uh, for your insights today. I also want to thank 
uh, the Legal Defense Fund uh, and the National Fair Housing Alliance uh, for hosting this conversation today. Um, obviously, there's a lot more to be said uh, on these subjects. Uh, I would encourage uh, everyone who is viewing this uh, to examine the works of everyone who's here uh, for the insights uh, on these crucial issues. And uh, thank you for spending uh, the past hour with us. Um, that's it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Jelani. Thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank for you all. <laughs>